Thank you. Good morning, I am Council Member Antonio Reynoso, the Chair of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. Thank you all for attending this uh, oversight hearing, which is an update on the city's organics collection program. I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by uh, Council Member Vallone from Queens. Uh, one NYC stated that the residential organics program will serve all New Yorkers by 2018. However, many communities will remain without service beyond the end of 2018. In May of 2018, the SNY announced that the city was temporarily halting the program's expansion. New York City has committed to a goal of sending zero waste to landfill by 2030. This is an extremely important and ambitious goal. If we are serious about reducing our waste, we have to commit more resources to the organics program. The 2017 waste char characterization study showed that organics is the biggest area of opportunity for the city to divert waste from landfill. 34% of residential refuse was suitable for organics collection. 51% of school waste was suitable for organics collection. And 32% of nitro refuse was suitable for organics collection. Unfortunately, most of this material is still ending up in landfill. Organic waste generates greenhouse gases if left to decompose in a landfill. Instead, organics can be collected and composted in nutrient-rich fertilizer or processed through anaerobic digestion and gas released can be captured for fuel. The SNY has been working to educate the public, but there is much more that needs to be done. In communities already receiving organics collection service, only 10.6 of the organic waste produced is getting sorted into the organic bins. The remaining 89% of organic waste is still being sent to landfill. If we look at the overall numbers, the outlook is even more concerning. The SNY has shown through their most recent waste characterization study that organic material makes up 34% of the residential waste stream. According to their 2017 refuse and recycling statistics, the SNY collected 81.4 tons of organic waste per day through curbside collection of a total of 11,823 tons per day in total material. This constitutes less than 1%. Once again, 34% of the city's residential waste stream is suitable for composting, and right now we are composting less than 1%. The city has set a goal of sending zero waste to landfill by 2030. It is clear that if we are to meet this goal, we will need to have a mandatory citywide organics collection program in the coming years. I am looking forward to the SNY's testimony and learning how they plan to engage and support the public moving forward what the timeline is to continue expansion of the program, and what other efforts should be made to ensure that it is successful. I also look forward to hearing testimony from DSNY, environmental advocates, and other interested groups about their experience with the city's efforts to reduce waste and any advice that they have for how much more we could be doing. So I want to thank uh, uh, the commissioner for being here and also the deputy commissioner, Bridget Anderson, um, and take it away. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna swear you in. Okay. Okay. Do you yeah, you can just just close it. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Thank you. Good morning, Chair Reynoso and members of the committee on sanitation and solid waste management. I am Catherine Garcia, Commissioner for the Department of Sanitation. I am joined today by Bridget Anderson, Deputy Commissioner for Recycling and Sustainability for the Department. Thank you for holding the hearing on the status of the Department's Residential Organics Collection Program. I will be making an opening statement, after which I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Organic waste, including food waste, yard waste, and food soiled paper products, makes up one-third of everything New Yorkers throw away. That is a staggering 1.1 million tons per year. Putting this resource to good use is the cornerstone of sustainable waste management, not only because of our commitment to send zero waste to landfills, but also because when organic waste decays in landfills, it produces methane, a greenhouse gas 25 times as potent as carbon dioxide. Sustainable organics management makes business sense and adds to our city's resiliency. We can use organic waste to our advantage. Through composting, we can create a valuable, beneficial product that enriches our soil to grow new food. And through anaerobic digestion, we can create clean, renewable energy to heat our homes and fuel cars, trucks, and buses. 
That is why New York City last week made a strong statement by signing C40's Advancing, advancing Toward Zero Waste Declaration. Organics recycling is the next frontier of a recycling journey that started more than 30 years ago. Curbside recycling started with a pilot program for collection of newsprint and bottles. Today, our dual stream recycling program accepts all kinds of metal, glass, rigid plastic, cartons, and paper. Collections that were once every other week now occur weekly, and the diversion rate is growing, finally, recovering from a rollback of the program undertaken during the financial crisis that followed the attacks on our city on 9-11. However, it is important to remember that even this program, which many of us take for granted today, started small and took time to build participation. Our organics program also began as a very small pilot, just 3,200 households in the neighborhood of Westerly on Staten Island in 2013. Shortly after that pilot, the council passed Local Law 77 of 2013, which mandated an expanded pilot program for homes and schools. The last time this committee held an oversight hearing on the city's organics collection program was February of 2016, following the submission of the final pilot report required by Local Law 77. At that time, the city's curbside organics collection program served 650,000 residents. Today, just two and a half years later, this program is available to more than 3.5 million New Yorkers in all five boroughs. In the two and a half years since that last hearing, the program has expanded to more than 2.8 million additional residents, equal to the combined populations of Seattle, San Francisco, Boston, and Portland, Oregon. It is the most aggressive and most rapid expansion of a curbside organics collection program in this country's history. That is an impressive feat for which I have to commend the hard work of my staff, our community partners, and committed residents and activists. I also thank the City Council for your consistent support of this important program. This past May, at the fiscal year 2019 executive budget hearing, I testified that the department had placed the implementation schedule for the expansion of the curbside organics collection program on hold with the goal of increasing efficiencies and streamlining the program. I want to be clear, however, that the residential organics program continues to operate in all neighborhoods currently receiving organics collection. We continue to educate and engage residents in the newest service areas with door-to-door -door canvassing and targeted campaigns highlighting the program's benefits. In fiscal 18, our multilingual outreach staff hosted more than 1,000 events, including tabling presentations with community groups, street tree care, and one-pound bag compost giveaways. Our program is the largest of any other municipal curbside organics program in the nation and one of the largest in the world. The department, in collaboration with the Office of Management and Budget and the Office of Labor Relations, is evaluating the program to ensure that residents receive the very best curbside organics collection service and that we are building a strong foundation for continued growth. We are hopeful that as these discussions continue, we will be able to announce a new rollout schedule in the coming months. As with any new program, we continue to assess if its effectiveness and the most appropriate tactics to achieve the city's goals. For example, we identified new ways to achieve efficiencies in our operations by experimenting with different fleet assignments. In some districts, we had started collection on a twice weekly basis using dual bin trucks with one side collecting refuse and the other collecting organics. However, we found that the side of the truck used to collect household refuse was too small to fit couches, mattresses, and other bulky items. This had caused a spike in miscollection complaints for bulky items and forced us to run several additional trucks a week dedicated to collecting these bulky items. Over the last year, we have refined what we call the quote-unquote hybrid collection model, which uses a dual bin truck to collect refuse and organics once a week on recycling day and a single bin rear loader to collect just refuse on the other collection day to better accommodate large items. This summer, we completed the transition of the four remaining dual bin districts to the hybrid model. We have seen consistent reductions in costs related to the organics collection program in these districts as a result, and we continue to evaluate other opportunities for efficiency. Since 2013, we have conducted regular surveys of participation in this voluntary program. 
As a result, we have found that providing once per week service does not significantly impact participation or diversion rates since residents in neighborhoods with twice weekly service typically placed out their brown bins for collection on their recycling day only. In order to grow program participation, we have also distributed zero waste bags and thank you cards to recognize program participants. Residents who don't participate receive a card encouraging them to participate in the future. Our frowny banana. On average, we've seen a 12% increase in participation from this strategy. In addition to the department's curbside organics collection program, the department continues to support food scrap drop-off sites in all five boroughs where residents can drop off their organic leaves at green markets, parks, gardens, and other community spaces. We also continue to support local community composting in New York City, and we are excited to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the New York City Compost Project later this year. The department also continues to work with businesses in New York City to encourage food waste reduction, reuse, and recycling among New York City businesses. In accordance with Local Law 176 of 2017, the department is currently developing a food donation portal we expect to launch in March of 2019. The food donation portal is being built as a new component of DSNY's web-based and mobile donation platform, Donate NYC. The goal of the portal is to reduce food waste in New York City by increasing food donations from businesses with surplus edible food by matching donor food establishments with food rescue organizations. This portal will serve the dual goals of helping to feed our most vulnerable residents while also contributing to our zero waste goals. In the commercial sector, the department continues to implement and enforce requirements for food waste separation and recycling under local law 146 of 2013. Last year, we began enforcing organic separation requirements at stadiums, arenas, large hotels, large food wholesalers, and large food manufacturers. Earlier this year, we adopted rules expanding these requirements to large restaurants and grocery stores, along with chain restaurants. We are currently conducting extensive outreach to these newly designated covered establishments and will begin conducting enforcement early next year. The city is building a new way of thinking about food waste. We can and we should be connecting edible food to people in need, and we can change the discarded banana peel from trash to rich soil and natural gas. And it's not just about preserving the environment. Unnecessary food waste increases grocery bills and the cost to operate a restaurant. We will continue to explore ambitious and comprehensive sustainability strategies to divert organic waste, reduce methane emissions in landfills, create compost, and generate local renewable energy. On behalf of the department, I thank this committee for holding a hearing on the important topic of our residential organics collection program today. I would also like to thank Speaker Johnson, Chair Reynoso, and all the members of this committee for their continuing support of our residential organics collection program and the residents who participate in this important program. We look forward to working with you to continue to expand this program to meet our goal of serving all New Yorkers, and we thank you for your ongoing commitment to achieving our zero waste goals. I am now happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony, Commissioner. Um, I guess the first question would be, how long do you anticipate halting the expansion of the organics program? We are still um, working through when we would begin again. Um, uh, I'm hoping that it will be, we will have an answer shortly, but I do not anticipate that we would start now this close to snow season. Um, so the department's sort of in that mode of moving towards thinking just about uh, being prepared for snow. Okay, so. It would not, I would not anticipate prior to spring. Okay. Um, and then prior to spring, and then how long thereafter do, do we feel that um, the rest of the city of New York would have access to organics recycling? So if we started in April of next year, we would be able to complete before the end of calendar year 2019. Okay. That is for all of the uh, areas that we've identified that are low and medium density. Uh, today in high density areas, we ask that people apply and we are still doing enrollments uh, of buildings that are larger than nine units. Um, so I guess a, a larger, bigger picture question, how does the DSNY propose to reach zero organic waste to landfill by 2030? Do we have a, uh, I guess a vision here that we can, he I guess hear today about how we really truly feel that we can get to zero waste 
uh, I guess, in the organics portion at least. Absolutely. So really, it, it's the first step is obviously about um, both being able to provide the curbside service and encourage the investment required in the processing in the back end. We are seeing that happen. Um, but like traditional recycling, it will not happen overnight. Um, we are seeing participation in all of the districts, some more than others. Uh, but we think the first step is really about making sure that the service is available and that we are doing all of the outreach required. Uh, but just to give you a little bit of context, so we are often held up to some place like San Francisco. Uh, they started their pilot program in organics uh, in 2001, and it took them about eight years before they really had everyone on board and actually participating. Um, and so I do not think that we need to necessarily take e eight years, but uh, just to give you some context around very, very successful programs and how they did it in a very stepwise, uh, thoughtful way, and I think it made it more successful as we move forward. So, so let's talk about how far we've gotten so far. Um, so what percentage of the city's residents currently have curbside collection? So it's three and a half million of the eight and a half million residents in the city have access to it. So, um, and what percentage um, will have curbside collection once the expansion resumes and is complete? So is it all, it won't be all eight million residents? In the well, city? I mean, it, I guess it depends on how you define it. I mean, there is also the, all of Manhattan technically, if they will apply, would have access to it today. Um, I don't anticipate that they, from our interactions with many building owners, it's been primarily copes and condos. Uh, rental buildings have been a little bit slower to take up of the service, but um, so we would anticipate that, you know, you could make the case that they already have the access if they wanted it, um, but they have not yet taken us up on it. So we think that it would make it so that there would be availability if you chose to participate by the end of next year, if we start in April. And then, so who would be using the drop-off locations versus the curbside collection? So any building, <coughs> whether or not you are in a curbside district or in a high-density district, uh, is required to enroll because we think that uh, just providing them with the bins and not, because we are not interacting with the owner or the tenant who actually puts the waste out, uh, that we won't have success. So where we've had success with larger buildings is when we have engaged with that building's management company. And so those are what's available. But right now your building management company could say, I don't wanna do it. And so th we wanna make sure that there are drop off sites for those people whose buildings are not as supportive of the city's sustainability goals. So let's talk about participation rates, um, our favorite subject uh, when it comes to organics. Um, what's the average in community board districts that have, uh, that have actually participated in the program? What's been your, I have a 10.6%, is that more or less what you have? Yes, I mean that is more or less. I mean there's some that are participating over 40%. Um, but there are some that are holding us down a little more on the lower percentage and are not, are not participating as much as we would like. Um, so and that's why we have been doing an enormous amount of outreach over uh, the last few months because we rolled out 10 districts in the last year. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's also um, making sure that we are continuing to encourage people to be participants. Um, we have had some people when we surveyed them say, I eat out every day, uh, you know, I'm not gonna participate. Or the very funny one of the chef who Instagrammed us and said, I have no food waste because I use all my food waste. Uh, so, you know, you find out interesting things about New Yorkers, but there are, we are having to overcome the ick factor. There are many people who think because it's in a different bin um, that it is in some way different than putting it in a black bag, which it's really not. Uh, and so once we sort of get folks to participate, they usually stay with us. Um, it's that first hurdle. And you know, the, fir the way that they usually start is through yard waste because you usually are doing that not in your kitchen um, and you're already collecting it sort of separately as an activity. 
and for most people, they seem to be more comfortable starting. That's their first foray into the into the program. So, because we always ask this, that question related to participation, I guess lessons learned. I think a lot of folks want to hear um, from the last hearing we had related to organics, which was kind of the beginning of the halt uh, to the program to now. Um, just what what have you seen um, that is going to be helpful long term? Um, for the growth of the organics program, um, and also, uh, I know you spoke in your testimony about the changes you've already made that you think can be helpful as well, but I think uh, folks want to hear more about what changes happened, what lessons were learned, because the long-term uh, sustainability of this program is important to folks. So if you could just really start like talking about um, that part of it. Absolutely. So there have been a lot of sort of interesting lessons. One was... Um, the use of plastic bags and allowing people to use a clear plastic liner uh, was very important to many residents, made them more likely to participate. Uh, giving them the right number of bins. We were, in some cases, giving people too many bins, and then they felt a little overwhelmed because we did it by number of units in the building. Uh, looking at the routes, in some cases, some of the organics routes were too long uh, and weren't achievable. Uh, looking at moving to the hybrid program and making sure that we uh, were reducing the amount of bulk trucks. I think that we didn't realize how much bulk was really getting thrown out every week. That we, there was a surprising amount of bulk. Um, and... Uh, you know, sort of that, those were sort of things so both on the operational side, but also on the, um, on what the experience is for the resident. In addition, we have been experimenting with a lot of different outreach campaigns, uh, whether or not it's around the fact that you have a sealed bin for food, you're mo less likely to have vermin or rodents and actually making that case directly, um, or the behind the bin campaign where we, we talk about the sanitation department and the people who work at the sanitation department being the ones who are bringing this to you, which it can be compelling in certain areas. Um, we did a pun. I didn't read any of the puns. I can read some of the puns later, but uh, that was a social media campaign which engaged many people. Uh, so we are really trying to experiment with what our messaging is uh, but this is very new, so our participation rate is more or less on track with where back long, long ago we started doing recycling, the more traditional recycling. And in that work that you did since the halt, reduction in cost, um, increasing in efficiency, just what, what did that look like? So, I mean, like, just in the four districts we just completed, we reduced the number of trucks we were using by 39. That is you know, approximately $2 million. And in 39 out of how many trucks were used? Oh, and that, in those couple of districts, I would have to go back and look at that. I was just looking at the data. <laughs> um, but, you know, that that's a, a real dollar figure. And so those were costs that we had not anticipated, and so it was really about making it so that we were streamlining and getting back towards where we felt we should be on the budget. So last year we asked the administration to put $10 million in the budget for marketing. Um, it's a, the $10 million would have had you closer to the Vision Zero goal um, that DOT has, and I just don't feel that um, you're getting the same support as the Department of Transportation is getting. Um, of course, the $10 million never went into the budget. Uh, you know, can you speak to what you do? You've already talked about zero waste education and so forth. I really feel that television ads would go a long way um, but uh, can you go down more into what your public engagement looks like and um, so whether or not you think ten million, uh, the money you currently have is enough when it comes to the education portion of it? So um, I mean, it's, ha it's hard for a commissioner to turn away $10 million. Uh, but I do think that one of the things that's slightly different about Vision Zero and, and, the, and the Zero Waste Goals is... Um, sort of more than one fold. One is that you know, you're talking about people who are getting killed on the streets. And so I'm, I do believe, I actually do believe that's a somewhat higher priority. Um, but one of the things that's also true about the organics program is how important person to person 
contact is in terms of your messaging, that that's where we see the participation. Um, and we know on Vision Zero, a lot of it is also driven by even stronger enforcement. But just to show off some of our artwork and things, so we've been using the links uh, a lot. Uh, and I also think that we've done some work with Subway Advertising, though not with the Organics and some other programs, which we think made a difference. Uh, and we continue to use social media. But it's, you know, things like this. Send, send roaches and rats and mice somewhere else for dinner. Uh, these seem to resonate uh, on the link, so this is it. Looks better at night. Uh, and then the behind the bin, meet the people behind your brown bin, which we've been using. So on links and on bus shelters and, and things like that. Uh, and then this is was our social. Giving us your egg scraps, excellent. Let us tell you about recycling food scraps. Let us. I feel like you had you had something to do with a couple of these. I don't think you're telling us, but I feel like you you enjoy. Being curious it. about composting. Right. Um, no, no, I had nothing. I was. I am. I do not do puns, uh, or at least I don't intentionally do puns. Uh, so, you know, I think that that obviously education and outreach is a never-ending part of our. Um, of our program, uh, but the other thing that I do think has been important for New Yorkers who want to do it is seeing the closed loop. So really seeing like I gave you my food scraps and you gave me back compost. So we've done a lot of giveaways of compost uh, and you know people see the difference. I've had people come up to me and say I didn't think the compost would make that much of a difference uh, in my garden. but either the vegetables were bigger, the flowers were bigger, uh, because of how nutrient rich it is, and also because it holds water to the soil. So obviously not a problem this year, but in prior years where you've had very dry summers, whatever moisture there is is getting held to the roots of those plants. And so that connection for New Yorkers has been very, very important. So I have a lot, a lot of questions, but I want to allow for Councilmember Vallone to ask a, a couple of questions, and then I'll, I'll get back to, to asking some. So, Councilmember Vallone. Just a few. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Commission. Good and morning. Here. Um, congratulations for taking on this ambitious project, and you know we in the city have to do better to try to figure out how the best way to get this thing moving. Um, my communities was one of the ones that started in the pilot program, and I guess I got to see firsthand on the neighbors that uh, quickly jumped in, Neighbors that quickly were mm, skeptical, yeah. came up with the old, you know, the raccoons and everything else that's going to be a problem at the community mm -hmm. boards. And um, But in the end, I think everyone realized it's a, a, a noble and worthy topic and we should approach it. But it began to, like, wear down. And I think now as I look in my community, I don't see the brown bins out anymore. So I, I think there's part of the pilot is, is understanding how we launched it, how we can make it better how we can assist what some of the homeowners and, and concerns were and how we can make it a little bit better. Um, I don't have the answers to those questions because we, we were part of it. But I did see that, like with every family, the children are really the bosses. Mm -hmm. And if the children embrace the topic, they can guilt any parent into doing just about anything. And I think when they see the good of, the, of this and how it impacts, because through our, their eyes, we do everything. Um, I think there might be an opportunity to work with DOE and our public schools and our schools to maybe take a new look at expanding the, the knowledge of the program into the schools and have children take ownership of it. Then they will be the ones to say, hey, mom, dad, uh, why aren't we throwing out this in a separate bag? I do it at school. I do mm -hmm. it in my parks. Because um, even parks could participate. Um, with how many different things we're doing in the parks from sports games and community activities, people are bringing things there, we can separate there. I think we can expand, it's not just on your shoulders, is what I'm saying. I think everyone should be part of this, otherwise change is difficult. And, and sometimes, you know, folks are just gonna say, I'm very easy to do what I'm doing, throw it in the garbage and not do. So I'm looking to try to maybe help in expanding the program to additional uh, areas and, and, and agencies, and I think the schools would be a natural area for 
schools. Right. No, we are in we uh, we are not. I believe in schools in your uh, school district. We are in about uh, over eight hundred schools. Get Organics Collection. Um, and we do try and match that with where we are doing the residential program because I agree with you, the children are very good advocates, um, and I would like to think of them as uh, my secret weapons with their parents. They're uh, very good at that. Yeah, no, I actually <laughs> did one a litter thing, and I was like, you know, they were like three and four year olds, and I was giving a poster prize, and I was like, do your parents litter? And they go, oh yes, and I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're going to work on that for me, aren't you? Um, they came clean right away. Uh, <laughs> but I do think that they're um, about making sure that we're both getting their parents and that they're ready to be the future recyclers. They're ready to be the folks who really are in the know. Um, and we would love to work more with you and with uh, your civics and your community boards and engage with residents in your neighborhoods to see you know, how we can do better, what would make it, what would make it more effective for them. Yeah, I think that would be a great place to start. And to, after the initial uh, entry of the program, there was a lot of support to the homeowners and, mm -hmm. and information, and people came to the door, and then it kind of stopped. So I, I think everybody needs a gentle re-kick <laughs> to get the thing going and to, to say, hey, have you had any issues in the beginning? I see you started, but I don't see the brown baskets out anymore. Um, what can we do? I, th I think there was definitely a, a good push, and then I think there was some concerns, and then folks kind of just faded away with it. So we need to get them back on track. So uh, I'm just saying it shouldn't all fall on your shoulders. I think we should try to get as many different agencies and folks and schools and kids involved in it. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you for your support. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Councilmember Vallone. So I guess uh, what we're hearing and hearing from Councilmember Vallone and his experience in his district, in my district, it's the same thing. I think a lot of the brown bins were out early because a lot of folks didn't bring them inside the house when you dropped them off. They just kept them out for decorations. Uh, in front of their buildings, and now I think folks either got rid of them or have them in their backyard. Um, who knows? Um, but I guess the goal here is to get to zero waste, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the halt of the program is a big concern for folks because it just delays the, the opportunity for us to be citywide mm -hmm. first, and second, to eventually get to a place where it's mandatory. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the mayor did make a commitment that he, or not a commitment, he just publicly said, that um, organic should be uh, manda mandatory. I just want to know, what is the administration's take on this still? What is your timeline, I guess? Um, that's what people want to hear, a timeline as to how we get to mandatory collection, because then we can really start, um, I guess, understanding how, how we're going to get to zero waste. Absolutely. No, I mean, I, I completely agree with the mayor. I do think that uh, mandatory will be a key tool. Um, I just don't think we're there yet. And I know you want specifics on exactly when I think I'll get there. Uh, and I just don't have that yet. Um, but I think we should be continue to work together because uh, I'm going to need your help uh, if we're going to do something like mandatory. That would be a big change for the city of New York. Um, and I think as I've said to you before, it's like, you know, there are New Yorkers who will do things because it's very environmentally sustainable and they are very committed. There are New Yorkers who will do things because it's the coolest thing to do. And then there are no New Yorkers who will do things because there's some sort of financial penalty involved. Um, and obviously, uh, mandatory programs would increase diversion. We're just, we're just not quite there yet. And I think I wanna continue to work with you uh, to figure out what exactly that timeline is uh, over the next few months. I just think folks, you know, and, and I don't, I'm not saying that you're not being honest, but for transparency purposes, folks really need to hear that the administration has a plan, that they have a, a goal. It's been, it's been quite some time since Zero Waste has been put out, and it, there still feels like this uh, piecemeal approach to trying to get something done. Um, I know we do it with zonings and, and other, uh, rezonings and other things here in the city, but I, I really think it comes, there comes a time when we just need a plan, a mm -hmm. comprehensive plan on how we're going to get it done. And it just seems like we can never get there. Um, and I'm always getting answers, um, not only from you, but um, other commissioners that, you know, we, we don't know yet or we're kind of playing it by ear or we'll know soon. Um, but eventually you just need to sit down and have it, have it um, together, put together. And we're very in the waste community, I would call us. We're very patient, understanding, and want to be helpful 
to the city in making this happen. I don't think if you put a schedule or a timeline together that we're going to have you here the day after you said you were going to do something and say you're the worst people in the world. Just we want to understand why it took longer or why it's holding you back. We really want to be partners more than anything else. And I think not having a timeline puts us at a disadvantage as to when we expect to be helpful, when we can show up, when we can push things. So I just really want to urge that we get to a place where there is a timeline. Um, and, and I think that that could help us. Uh, no, because I, I, I'm not, I'm not, it's just not, I don't know how I can help if I don't know when you're supposed to be doing things. So um, I really appreciate your comments. And the, we could not be doing this without the support we've had from the city council or from the entire advocate community. Uh, it would not be happening today, as big as we've gotten. Uh, and I appreciate uh, your desire to continue to be supportive and your need to have more information in order to do that. Uh, and I will work very hard to get that to you um, to make sure that you can hold the administration accountable for meeting its goals. So hopefully this will be the last organics committee hearing where we don't have a timeline. This will I be the last organics committee hearing where we don't have a timeline. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much for that. Now that I will hold you to, though. Yes. I'm not going to lie. I said I would be, but not that one. I think it's important. I think a lot of people are here and just want to get to the next level. We're not having a hearing next week, right? No. No, <laughs> no next month. Um, no, we will. But it, it no, is. No, we have a snow hearing next month, I'm yes, sure. It's, uh, it's October. Come it's on. not going to snow. Um, but so then we know, we know that these things, um, getting to zero waste, uh, you know, they, it's not an independent thing. They all have um, uh, par partnering initiatives that are extremely important. Um, the Save As You Throw program, uh, just would that help increase uh, participation and maybe something that comes prior to, uh, comes prior to mandatory? Uh, At this point, we have not been focused on save as you throw. Obviously, the research shows that uh, diversion rates go up in cities that use an approach like that, but New York is very different uh, than than other cities where it's been successful, but it hasn't been our focus right at this moment. Okay, I just want to, for the general public, uh, Speaker Corey Johnson had made a comment uh, after getting caught at the lobby, um, I think with misinformation or maybe a lack of information about what Save As You Throw is, um, and said, oh, I would never have the city of New York residents pay for their trash. That's not exactly what we're doing. So um, I've had a conversation with him since then, and I won't, I don't want to speak for him, but there is an openness to have a conversation about what Save As You Throw really is, and uh, you know, n not having been bombarded at a lobby about, you know, oh, we're gonna pay for our trash. So just want you to know that moving forward, we're having a more serious conversation and dialogue about what Save As You Throw is, um, to see if we can be supportive of that program as well, because um, if the city council is not on board, I can see how that makes it difficult and. If it, make, if it becomes difficult, then we can't get to zero waste by 2030, which is everyone everyone that's here today, their goals. Um, so just want to make sure the public knew that. Yes. Do you have the cost per ton of the program currently? Do you have information as to what that costs so that we, so that we can, I guess, put it in play as in the program was mandatory with the cost. I don't have the per cost ton. per ton, and the cost per ton for mandatory would be different than what the cost per ton is now because you'd achieve more economies of scale. And it also has to do with the balance of projecting what the cost will be on the regular refuse side on the offset, but we can definitely get you that information. Okay, so the next part of it is the budget right now for for the program is currently at about 15.7 million. Um, there's no one in this room that thinks that's the amount of money that's gonna be necessary for, for rolling this out. Um, maybe the pilot program, it makes sense, but long term, um, we know that that's not sufficient. We just wanted to know um, what cost, I guess, or, or what the budget would be to, to play this out longer term, so um, and whether or not you have that. Um, you're correct. It would require more. Um, we are in negotiations with our oversights about exactly what that number is. 
um, and then I assume they would bring that number to the council, um, but it would it will be higher. And is there is promising conversations related to an increase in the budget for that? There are a lot of conversations. A lot of conversations, but not necessarily promising. I have my good days and my bad days. <laughs> but just know that from our part, we're going to do a lot of work here because we know that it's not where it needs to be and that the city needs to pony up and do a lot more. So um, where you can't advocate, we can. Just a, a heads up. But we know that there's a lot more that needs to be done, done there. Um, this food, stra uh, food scrap drop-off program. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Food scrap drop-off program. Mm -hmm. Say that five times fast. Um, there was funding included in FY18 to expand it. Mm -hmm. Is there going to be more of an expansion, I guess, or, or, or are we going to continue the expansion to fiscal year 2019? Yeah, no, we, so we're at about 134 sites, and actually in the next, uh, very, very shortly, we're going to add another 12 sites. Um, we continue to think that that's an important component of the program. Um, it's also an opportunity for us to engage with the public on a day-to-day -day basis, whether or not they are actually dropping off. It's uh, a physical presence where someone will come up and ask, what is going on here? Uh, and that is you know, part of the outreach. Why are these people coming and bringing you food waste? Like, what is happening? Um, and so there's often a lot of interaction at these sites. Uh, so we think that it's an important component of the program going forward. So you're saying we should get thousands and thousands of more these drop-off locations and just to sh being able to see them, people ask questions and they all participate. Absolutely. All right. Let's talk about the schools. Councilmember Malone mentioned that school educating the children related to organics would be helpful, but the schools themselves are supposed to be participating in this. And uh, folks feel that the school environment is a controlled environment. I and mean, because it's controlled, we should, if we can't knock them out the park in, in a school, you know, the city doesn't bode well. Um, so just want to, your experience in schools, how are we doing? What are the obstacles? Um, and are they also assisting you in doing a better job at the, at the I guess, uh, at the residential portion of, of, the, of the program? Um, so they're about a little bit over 800 schools that are participating in the organics program. I mean, the schools made a commitment to remove their styrofoam trays, to make sure that they were using compostable ware. Um, and so there are many schools that are doing very, very well. The ones that have green teams and really committed people, particularly in the cafeteria and with uh, food service, they have been the most successful. Um, we have targeted about 100 schools to not only increase their organics participation, but also their paper and their metal glass and plastic participation. And we've seen uh, both changes in uh, their diversion rates, but also some real crea creativity. We run um, an awards program for them, and so that they actually will in incorporate the whole concept into their curriculum, and those have been the most successful. Um, you know, this is an ongoing conversation with the DOE because just like uh, with a large residential building, there are a lot of place people who are touching it. So it's the food service people, it's the students in the building, it's the teachers, it's the custodial staff before it hits the curb. Um, so we have seen some real commitments in many of the schools. Um, the elementary is a little better than the high school. Uh, but you know, we continue to work very closely with the Department of Education, and they have actually committed resources and hired people on the sustainability front. I have actually personally met with their custodial union to talk through how to improve the program, what do their custodians need, how, what trainings do, can we help them with. Uh, so this is an ongoing real commitment to try and make the school sort of the shining light, so to speak. What is their participation rate? Are they doing well? Well, well, not diversion rate. I'm sorry. The diversion yeah, their rate. diversion rates. I mean, their diversion. They're they're sort of hard to do a comparison because their waste is different than a residential building. Um, but I think that they are usually over fifty percent in the ones where we have done the survey before and after. Uh, so we're getting much of the material into the program. 
but we need to get to zero waste, right? I so fifty percent doesn't work. So it, are we making? Pro I guess. Yes, year, no, they, year were, to they year. were lower, and they're getting. They have gotten better, particularly in the zero waste schools. Are they going? Are, when are we going to go to all the schools? Um, again, I I understand the pilot program being halted and and it being difficult to get to, to citywide. But again, the schools. These are our buildings. Why are we not in all schools? Why are we not doing this in all schools? Yeah. So I think that we will we will be trying to pair that with the rollout uh, next year. But uh, the the real question is whether or not I need to just in order to make sure I can get enough people to talk to everyone that we need to be talking to, whether or not they follow or come before the residential program. But they are we we view them as being uh, integral to move together. Um, but you know, we are in all of Manhattan, we are in all of Staten Island, we're in a lot of Brooklyn and Queens already. Uh, we just haven't made the jump to the next round yet. So the, the, the schools move with the program, I guess. As the implementation happens, you, you take on the schools as well. In certain cases, there, there's a little, it's, it's, it's a little more complicated only because the school collection trucks are crossing district boundaries many times. So there's not always a pair, but what we try and do is bring on the route of schools, uh, which may or may not be in the district. They may cross the line. Okay, then I guess, uh, what about private collection? How has that program been so far? I know there was some, some businesses that gave me a call about wanting to postpone it. Um, just want to know, how, has it been successful? Have you gotten reports back from, from so folks? So we, the first 300, which are required as of now, many are doing very well. Um, some, there is a small subsector where we have done enforcement action against them, and I've had to do multiple enforcement actions against them. Uh, on the other hand, we are, we are in the outreach for the next cohort, which is about 1,800 businesses. Uh, we are trying to make sure that we physically get everywhere before enforcement starts in January. Um, but they've had 18 months to prepare. So we notified them of the rulemaking. We did the rulemaking. We waited six months for the rule to go into effect. We're waiting another six months for us to do any enforcement. So I'm not sure that delay means they're going to do any better. Uh, one of the concerns that a business owner uh, gave me was, they don't have a basement. And when they're separating their trash, it kind of gets done like on the spot and then they just throw all their trash out to the, to the curb, I guess, um, for collection whenever it's going to be collected. But they said not having a basement makes it harder for them to continue to you know, be creative about how they separate their trash. <laughs> um, and that the square footage that uh, is used in the program for diversion uh, it only speaks to like, uh, I guess, um, I guess if they're a business that has, let's say, 10,000 square feet, of which none of it is basement space, um, they're competing against maybe a 5,000 square, square foot business on a, like a first floor and 5,000 square feet like on a basement, and that makes it more easier, easier and more convenient. Have you seen an issue with like actual access to like trash, uh, a trash facility, I guess, or a uh, or refuse uh, space so, um, in so buildings? In most we have not seen anything particular like you're describing. I can go back and ask the outreach folks for that specific scenario. But you know, we're talking about a restaurant that's 15,000 square feet. We're talking about a grocery store that's 25,000 square feet. Those are pretty big. Um, the concept that they don't have space, they've got to be putting it somewhere. It's not different than what they have now. Uh, so the volume should be the same. We're not adding waste. We're just making it so that just you... Just another step. Right. You just can't put everything in the same bag. Okay. It's good Good to hear that. Um, how many composting facilities do we have within like a 50-mile radius of the city, I guess? Um, of the Besides the one that we own on Staten Island yeah. uh, and the Newtown Creek uh, facility based on our research... There are 11 facilities that are either within a, 100 miles or have arrangements with a New York City transfer station. And long term, um, there's capacity. So that represents over 400,000 tons per year of capacity. Obviously, that will have to grow, but that is higher than it was two years ago. 
400,000 tons of capacity. 400,000 tons. And that's, yeah, a year, I guess. Per year. Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. How many carters are there that do specific or organics carting, er, carting of organics? Um, I guess that work with DSNY or? They don't, they don't report to us necessarily on organics. I know that Action provides it. I know that Mr. T provide it, provides it, and I believe ISI provides it. I'm not sure. Beyond that, I have not looked at that. Okay, maybe that's a big question. I think that they would be the one who would regulate it, and they would know whether or not they were providing the service from their customer service registry. And then maybe Harry would be happy to hear this headcount. We're going to need more people to move to, to pick up more trash or, or dive, dive, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, well, to run different streams. Yes, there you go, to run different streams. So are we going to need an increase in headcount? Do we need to start advocating for more sanitation workers? So that goes along with the question on how much the money is equated to people. So that, so is, that is the conversation we're having. And you... Is there a number? Are you negotiating with Harry already? Do you know no, how much? No, no. Um, we are not directly negotiating on a headcount number with Harry, no. All right. But you are working on, you have to have he, We are working with him closely on how to make the program effective, um, and he has been very helpful. Uh, but we don't, we, uh, we wouldn't, we wouldn't negotiate a headcount number. We wouldn't negotiate a program, and then it, that would derive from there. Right, but you're, I guess, internally, you're in the works of understanding what capacity you need related to headcount to do this work. Yes. Okay. And that would, that would be tied to the increase in the budget that you would get year in, year out to, to, to yes. completely fund this program. Yes. Okay. Uh, so... So that I, I have a couple more questions, but I think we're we're okay. I kind of want to get to the advocates and the folks in the room um, to ask a few questions. We'd love for you, of course, for uh, DSNY to stay. To stay. Um, but I really thank you for your time. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what the program looks like after it's f citywide, and then I'm looking forward to a timeline so we can start being helpful and helping you push this long term. So thank you again for your work. Very and clear on that. Thank you, Bridget. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to call the first panel, Eric Goldstein, Mark Schifflet, Melanie Weniger, and Melissa Ishan. Eric, you're not supposed to drop off paperwork in, in front of me like this. You could, you could attack me. I feel, I feel very unsafe. It's okay, it's okay. This will be the last time though. I know, Eric, very scary. Self-identified tree hugger though. But um, you guys can start where, however you want. So we're gonna give you three minutes just cause there's another hearing um, that's coming shortly after this one. But um, if you need a little extra time, we can, we can work it out. Just, go ahead. Eric, you wanna start? Sure. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Eric Goldstein from the Natural Resources Defense Council. Thank you for your leadership in calling this important hearing. 
Uh, the city's residential organics compost and collection program is one of the most important efforts ever undertaken by the sanitation department in terms of the potential it holds to reduce global warming emissions, enhance sustainability, and ultimately reduce the cost of collection and disposal to city taxpayers. But we're concerned that several aspects of the implementation of this essential program uh, are not meeting standards and believe that city council action <coughs> is necessary to continue the momentum moving forward. The sanitation department's commitment to provide curbside recycling was the single most important waste policy reform advanced here since the adoption of the recycling program 30 years ago. And this program, along with uh, commercial waste zoning, can be the two outstanding legacies of Commissioner Garcia and you and your committee. Uh, Commissioner Garcia has recognized the importance of composting since the very day she was named commissioner and deserves credit for that. Nevertheless, the uh, residential organics program needs help. For one thing, the program has suffered from communication shortfall. Homeowners and apartment dwellers in already served districts need more information regarding how and why to participate. Uh, second, the curbside collection schedules need to be at least as frequent as traditional trash collections so that they're convenient for participants. Uh, we've heard from some members that participation increased, decreased dramatically when organics collections were cut from twice a week to once a week. Uh, third, uh, some residents have complained that brown organics pails are not raccoon proof and that raccoon have knocked over and gotten into these pails and that cuts participation. Uh, as a result, as you've indicated, participation has fallen off, and although 3.5 million are eligible, perhaps 10% of the residents are participating now. These facts should not be grounds for pessimism because major programs like this often in, uh, encounter startup difficulties, but it's going to take some significant action by the council to uh, right the ship. Here are five recommendations. Today's hearing is a good start, but the sanitation department needs to complete a detailed assessment of what's working and what is not regarding implementation and submit this assessment to the council within, we recommend, four months. The document should have, as you've indicated, an implementation plan for actions the department will take in 2019 to address the problems now facing the program. Second, the de Blasio administration, also a point you've indicated, should fund a multifaceted public education initiative informing New Yorkers about this program. The department knows how to do this. And they can get help from Grow NYC, but the program needs funding. Third, the committee needs to advance legislation that would require all city agencies and city-owned buildings to separate their food waste for collection. Uh, public advocate Tish James has introduced legislation along these lines, and we encourage city employee, and this would encourage city employees to set the example for participation and boost the capture weight. Fourth, the sanitation officials need to cooperate with the department and the administration to pave the way for organics collection vehicle route adjustments with the goal of maximizing program effectiveness. Those conversations are ongoing, but we need continuing cooperation. And fifth, the committee should advance legislation that expands this voluntary program citywide by 2020 and makes the program mandatory by 2022. This would be consistent with cities like Seattle and San Francisco that have taken 10 years from the beginning of their program, ours started in 2013, to implementation full citywide mandatory. Uh, again, the, the commissioner, uh, we believe, and her staff are interested in advancing this. They need action by the council to make citywide and ultimately mandatory collection happening. And finally, uh, we uh, also like uh, council member Boulogne's idea of targeting the schools. We all agree that schools are where kids learn and bring those uh, messages on sustainability home. And so when the commissioner indicates that uh, 100 schools have these strong zero waste programs, that's terrific, but there are 1,000 schools. So we, we've got 90% of the schools that aren't getting the message and we would encourage you to consider legislation along those lines as well to get the school kids participating and understanding this program and bringing it home. Again, we thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Eric. I just wanted to say two things. It's almost like a, a, a double-sided sword, right? When we have two-day collection, we lose a lot of money in the city of New York, right? But participation is higher. When we have one-time collection, it saves us money and the trucks are fuller uh, and so forth. Um, so um, we're, we're just, 
yeah, Go ahead. if I can just respond in 30 seconds. Ultimately, we need to adjust collections so that if you have recycling collections and you have composting or organics collections, you are able, as almost every other city that's done this has uh, been able to do, you cut back the number of regular waste or traditional trash collections. As you've indicated, it's the same amount of trash. You're just collecting it differently. It requires some cooperation and some negotiations with the union, but there's no reason why we need to keep adding additional collections when it's the same amount or even a little less waste that New Yorkers are generating. And that sounds like a solution, a more long-term solution. I, I understand that. If they do that now and the trash will be in the streets, then we'll be in big trouble. But you're right. I get, I get what you're saying. Long-term reducing general waste because there should be less of it um, and increasing the organics waste collection program makes a lot of sense. So um, I hear that. And there was one other thing that you said. Um, yeah, so uh, we have a testimony from Tish James here. Um, that she's going to speak, uh, well, her representative is going to speak um, on behalf of, of Tish. Uh, so we're going to hear what they have to say about the legislation. And if um, pushing the legislation through the council would encourage people to participate um, or, um, or make it so that the city has to take it a lot more serious, uh, then it's something that we would do. So um, we're going to let Melissa go first, and then uh, Tish, Tish's rep will go next. Uh, and But thank you again, Eric, for your support um, on this matter. Thank you for your leadership. I might actually also have some ideas to address the concerns, so thank you for letting me speak. Good morning, my name is Melissa Yashan. I am a senior staff attorney at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest in the Environmental Justice Program. I'm here representing NILPI and the Transform Don't Trash NYC Coalition to underscore the importance of ensuring, ensuring that our city diverts waste from landfills and continues to make the necessary investments in a robust organics program to achieve the mayor's zero waste goals. I'd like to thank Chair Reynoso for holding this important hearing today and the opportunity to testify. We strongly support DSNY's organics program, which diverts food waste from landfills. Organic matter decomposing in anaerobic conditions in landfills is a major source of methane emissions, and recycling this material via compost composting or controlled anaerobic digestion processes is essential to reducing our city's greenhouse gas emissions. We also understand that DSNY faces significant cost-related challenges with the current curbside organic waste recycling program, which have caused the concerning pause in the program's expansion to every neighborhood in the city. While we are sympathetic to the difficulties the department faces in ramping up participation rates and tonnage on the relatively still new curbside collection routes, we believe that there are creative solutions that would increase the efficiency of the residential program while tackling the even larger problem of commercial organic waste. The commercial waste stream is estimated to be about equal to the residential one, about 3 million tons of putrescible trade waste per year and about one million tons of this huge stream are organic material. Troublingly, private transfer station reports filed with the DEC show that very little of this material is diverted to compost or digestion facilities. We also hear from business owners who want to participate in composting programs that commercial waste haulers simply do not offer the service at a scale or a price that makes sense, particularly for small and medium-sized food businesses. We believe DSNY could substantially increase small business participation in organics recycling and improve the efficiency of existing compost routes by offering brown bin organic service to small businesses in communities where DSNY already operates residential organic service. Such a program would allow workers to fill existing organics trucks, trucks allow small business owners to divert far more of their waste from landfills, and boost participation in a meaningful recycling program in advance of the new commercial waste zone system. DSNY could help to offset the cost of such a combined residential commercial collection program by charging a modest competitive price to participating businesses for brown bin service. This would accomplish the goal of increasing the volume of organic waste we divert from landfill by including commercial waste, and also address the efficiency obstacles that have caused DSNY to pause their expansion of curbside organics collection. This would also provide expanded options to small businesses and commercial enterprises who would like to reduce their carbon footprint and reduce landfill-bound waste. We know that Commissioner Garcia and DSNY share our desire to make strides in the push to zero waste and hope that together with the City Council, you will all seriously consider this idea as a possible path forward towards expanding curbside organics. Thank you. So, Melissa, you were very detailed, so I'm not going to ask any questions, but this is the first time that I've heard of this idea. So, 
I'm going to mull it over, talk to the commissioner about it, but um, very interesting and creative, to say the least. Um. Uh, good morning, Chair Renoso and Councilman Rivalone and members of the committee. My name is Melanie Weninger, and I am a policy associate for the New York City Public Advocate, Letitia James. Thank you for convening today's hearing and allowing me the opportunity to present testimony on her behalf. As the former chair of this committee, Public Advocate James has long been motivated to improve organics diversion in New York City. In the past five years, the Department of Sanitation, under the leadership of Commissioner Catherine Garcia, has significantly expanded the Residential Organics Collection Program, which now serves um, over 3.5 million residents in all five boroughs. Approximately 100 public schools in Brooklyn and Manhattan also participate in the collection program as part of the city's Zero Waste Schools Initiative. When Public Advocate James was chair of this committee, she sponsored and ushered the passage of Local Laws 77 and 146, uh, which laid the groundwork for the organics collection program. Those bills were passed with the understanding that food waste is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and therefore a significant factor in climate change. Um, chair Reynoso, the DSNY, and Commissioner Garcia deserve significant credit for expanding the collection program so widely as part of the city's efforts to achieve greater sustainability. Despite this progress, the organics collection program has experienced some challenges. Earlier this summer, uh, the department announced that it would be halting its planned expansion of the program pending further study. And this is of great concern to both the public advocate as well as many of the others in this room who believe in its importance. We have seen critical environmental programs like this be undermined before. In 2003, Mayor Bloomberg attempted to eliminate the city's metal, glass, and plastic recycling program, citing inefficiencies, and eventually suspended the plastic recycling program for one year and the glass recycling program for two years. It took significant pressure from this committee and environmental advocates, some of whom are in this room today, to restore the city's full recycling program. Our office understands that inefficiency is a real concern. Last month, we released a policy brief that analyzed the city's organics collection program and found that many of the collection trucks are operating well below capacity. Collection trucks can typically carry about 12 tons of waste, but in fiscal year 2017, we found that the trucks were carrying on average one half ton of waste from their routes. As a result, Public Advocate James recently introduced legislation aimed at improving the efficiency of this vital program by including city-owned administrative buildings. Specifically, this legislation, Intro 1075, mandates that these city-owned buildings participate in the source separation and collection of organics by July 1, 2019. The public advocate believes that a mandate of this kind is critical to improving the efficiency of the current program. It will increase the amount of organic waste that can be collected by DSNY without adding an, an excessive burden to the agency since these locations could be accommodated by existing routes. We believe an initial pilot or rollout could target buildings and districts that are already being provided with curbside organics collection. This legislation will also help to encourage greater behavior change among residents. Educating and training our considerable city workforce on the proper methods and benefits of organics collection can lead to positive ripple effects across the city as employees take that information and replicate it in their homes and share that knowledge in their communities. Um, if this model proves successful, the city should consider expanding organics collection to other institutions like CUNY, health and hospital facilities, which also generate food waste. Uh, we hope that the city will continue to grow and not stall its organics collection program, and our office is very committed to supporting this endeavor. Thank you for letting me testify today. Thank you for your testimony. And, and we might not have Tish much longer in this position, so yeah. you know, maybe a going away present. Um, Good morning, Chair Reynoso. Thank Good you morning. for allowing me to testify this morning. I'm Mark Schifflat. I'm a chair of the Organics Committee for the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board, or Manhattan SWAB. I'm going to bypass the introduction in the interest of time and just go right to the recommendations. One, improve in efficiency of existing curbside collection program. It is no secret that the city is spending millions of dollars to divert a tiny fraction of residential organic waste. According to analysis of DSNY's 2017-2017 waste characterization study, by the city's independent budget office, more organic material is collected as contamination of the metal glass plastic stream than it is in the curbside collection bin program. Curbside collections must be made more efficient if it is to become economically feasible. These are some potential ideas we ask the city to consider in order to improve the efficiency of the city's curbside program. Reduce weekly pickups within the curbside collection program. 
establish centralized block collections where feasible by consolidating curbside pickups within difficult to traverse neighborhoods, contract micro haulers to move and consolidate residential organics using low or no emission vehicles, such as pedal assist electric cargo bikes, connect smaller residential buildings with nearby local processors and increase drop off locations at convenient locations such as subway stops and encourage bin sharing. Two, create and distribute best management practices in residential user guides. It goes without saying that just like for mandatory recycling, organics diversion participation could be increased significantly behind a mass scale awareness building campaign. Until those funds could be allocated, perhaps it's most feasible to leverage outreach opportunities that exist intra buildings. According to the DSNY research, misperceptions about the issues associated with organics collection represents a significant barrier to uptake of the curbside collection program. But strategies for overcoming the challenges along with BMPs and user and design guides exist and are an essential part of envisioning a new road ahead. With the input of building staff and residents, BMPs will give clear guidance to building managers and co-op condo boards to more effectively develop their own unique sustainability programs. It is beyond critical that everyone be engaged in the process and understands their roles. Capitalizing on MSLOB's experience studying high-rise, high-density buildings in New York City, we can highlight some key learnings from our own use case studies. Educate residents about the benefits of organic collection, including climate mitigation and soil remediation. Deal head-on with the barriers to uptake by underscoring the unique design features of the brown rolling rodent-free carts. Establish new habits by providing residents with kitchen collection caddies and a starter set of compostable bags. And schedule launch events and workshops to underscore social norming. Three, support and expand existing small scale organics programs. We recommend that the city look for ways to build on the successes of existing small scale organics programs. It can do this by expanding managed community food scrap drop off sites through DSNY, as well as organizations like Grow NYC and New York City Compost Project. Assist in increasing the capacity of local community garden processors through the New York City Green Par Parks Green Thumb Program partner with groups like Green City Forest and Harlem Grown to tap into a youth recruitment base to educate and conduct outreach in low-income neighborhoods and NYCHA residences. And finally, study ways to develop additional small to medium scale organics processing sites on city-owned property. Many such programs exist. Uh, for example, in three years of accepting organics inputs from the community, the Pleasant Village Community Garden in East Harlem has increased its processing capacity to approximately three tons annually with the potential to easily double that amount. Though still a small fraction of New York City's overall organics output, with over 700 plus gardens citywide, community processors can make a significant impact on diversion rates. These programs should be encouraged to grow and funding should be made available for this purpose. The Manhattan Suave, in collaboration with Citizen Committee, has been awarding community composting grants since 2011. We have distributed over 100,000 micro grants to hundreds of community and school groups throughout the five boroughs. The number and types of composting projects grow each year. I'll just skip to the conclusion at this point. Community engagement and education is crucial to moving the city to a mandatory residential organics program. Public education in particular is needed to raise awareness for and an understanding of the critical importance of organics diversion and to have any hope of meeting zero waste goals. Much like the city's blue and green bin cartoon characters and other citywide recycling campaigns, we feel public awareness is essential if we are to have a successful citywide organics diversion program. Though we like to call ourselves New Yorkers, we are really a city of many small towns. We should be exploring ways to capitalize on that rich diversity and the competitive nature of our neighborhood affiliations. The savings gained through rationalizing the inefficiencies improving upon and improving upon existing programs can make the process less, less taxing and allow for greater experiment, experimentation through innovative pilots, best practices, private public partnerships, and borough-wide community education campaigns. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony as well. And I think uh, we have a council member, Chaim Deutsch, who has joined us and wants to ask a few questions from Brooklyn. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Garcia, um, and I think the e-waste expansion um, is amazing, and it's uh, it's um, it's really you know helping people, especially seniors or people with disabilities. The would have to up until now they would have to schlep their large television that they had from the 1960s or 70s. I don't know when television was first, uh, TV was first created, but it's very difficult to carry that into a car and then to bring it to a drop uh, drop in center. So thank you, Commissioner, for that, and also on the expansion of uh, corner waste baskets throughout uh, my district and as well as other districts. And as a community, you know, on my environmental scoreboard, I have 100 percent, and I'm all for protecting our environment. But we also need to take a look on uh, individuals. Um, I know that trash has become a full-time job. I know for me, uh, I've been I, I'm in charge of the recycling in my house, <laughs> and I have uh, four kids, uh, five children with my with my oldest daughter who's married, and two grandkids, usually running around the house and throwing cans and plastic all over the place. So I have to separate them. And I really give sanitation, the sanitation workers a really easy job by separating them properly and placing them outside. So we all know how difficult it is to recycle, which is, uh, it is important to make sure that we all do recycle. Um, but on another note, um, I just want to mention that when we're talking about our, our environment, we need to look at ourselves and look at other areas such as illegal dumping. Um, and the fact is we need to increase the amount of enforcement offices and sanitation to go after those illegal dumpers, whether it's household trash being put out in corner waste baskets, as well as people just dumping out loads of uh, trash from their truck after picking up a, de a, a demolition job and just dumping them under a train trestle or a dark area that uh, more than night when no one really could, uh, could see. So we need to enforce the sanitation and go after these people because keeping our streets clean is part of our environmental obligations. So I'd like to make, I'd like to see that um, sanitation enforcement uh, for legal dumpers, um, we, we should have that throughout the city, especially now that we raise the fines uh, on illegal dumping, but without enforcement, those illegal fines, raising illegal fines really don't mean anything because you need to catch those people. So I just want to, I see the commissioner here, so I just want to ask you if you could, if we could, um, um, you know, really step up on the enforcement, because I know we only have 50 enforcement offices in the city for illegal dumping, and if some of them are on maternity leave or paternity leave or out sick or on vacation, then we're left with almost nothing in the city in five boroughs, uh, 8.6 million people. A in addition to that, like I always mention, I will mention it again and again and again, that um, when it comes to holidays, when people have their pickups on the holidays, you have 12 days throughout the year that they should be, um, be able to pick up, the sanitation department should pick up trash the next day after a holiday. We're not going to ask them to work on a holiday, but at least the following day, all trash should be picked up, keeping our streets clean. I know when I sit out in my backyard, you have raccoons, you have possums, and they surprise me. Uh, when I'm out there uh, sending emails at one o'clock in the morning and or speaking to some of my colleagues, you have, you know, so when trash cans are left outside, even though they're secure, but eventually if they're left out too long, they get knocked over. So we need to make sure that um, um, sanitation is funded 100%, not 50%, not 90%, but 100%. And uh, I know it's a budget issue. We need to make sure for the next budget that we fully, 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 fully fund our sanitation department who does an amazing job by picking up our trash 100% uh, of the times and without delay. And this way we could hold everyone else accountable by setting a good example. And finally, I just want to end up by saying that uh, now that you have, um, uh, you have regular trash recycling and organics, so those dual trucks are a big help because um, especially seniors and people with disabilities, they have to place their trash out while well, they do everything at one time. But picking up the trash, I don't want them to see them, you know, having to worry about the trash cans, you know, pulling them back three times, three different times during the day uh, on, on their pickup days. So if we have the dual trucks, it will help and make people's lives easier. So that's very important. So I just want to say that for the record. And once again, I want to thank our chair um, for his advocacy 
uh, and uh, Commissioner Garcia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Deutsch. Uh, thank you to the panel for your testimony. And I think we have one more panel um, left. So we'd like to call up Meredith Danberg, Filarelli, uh, Vandra Thobram, Myron Alexander, Christine Dats Romero, and Steve Newman. And can the sergeant add another chair to the to the panel? I think that. Huh? So let's yeah, so Steve Newman, but uh, I actually so this is this must be Myron? Are right, you going to be the last person to speak? But we only have space for four. So can you just wait? Uh, thank you. I apologize for that. Oh. oh. Okay. All right. Sounds good. There you go, Myron. Welcome back. All right. We're going to start from my left or your right to left. Uh, thank you. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for holding this hearing. I apologize. I'm going to have to get up and run because we're running a zero waste event in Union Square today. Um, so I have to get back <laughs> you have there to and yeah, good separate job. trash. So if you're in Union Square and you see a giant tent, uh, I'll be by a trash can. You should have um, let us know earlier. We would have brought you up right away. That's OK. I wanted to hear what everyone else had to say. Uh, my name is Meredith Danberg Ficarelli. I am the director of Common Ground Compost. And I have been a resident of New York since 2007. Um, I work in the, in the recycling industry as a consultant, setting up composting and recycling programs, and running an electric assist bike-powered compost collection program um, here in Manhattan. Our services focus on education and awareness about waste, and the small changes we can make in our daily lives to reduce waste and act as more environmentally responsible individuals and businesses. This always includes composting, whether it's in a commercial kitchen, an office building, or the home. During my time with Common Ground Compost, I've led trainings for more than 1,000 people, and I can tell you, people are genuinely interested in trash. They want to know where their garbage goes. They're curious about how recycling works. They're intrigued and sometimes shocked to learn about the conditions and tasks of the workers that collect and process their waste. And they want to participate in organics recycling once they learn that it can reduce the exorbitant costs that we currently face to ship our waste and organic waste to landfills outside of the city. I'm glad to see the city adapting to the challenges of high collection costs due to a lack of participation in the Brown Bin program. I have seen DSNY trucks tipping organics at a transfer station for pre-processing and noted that the loads tipped did not come close to the truck's capacity, to meeting the truck's capacity. The current focus on a distributed network of residential drop-off points for DSNY Brown Bin collection is a great approach. And I have enrolled in the program through the community garden that I help run in the East Village. At this site, the small compost collection program that I run already operates a free compost drop-off program for residents, and my program staff process these organics in the garden. This program has a few corollaries across the city, but it is not common. In fact, the majority of gardens, not to mention community spaces like churches and other organizations, do not have the capacity or the dedication to manage a compost bin, even if they are not processing the materials themselves. Enrolling in the Brown Bin program was straightforward. A Department of Sanitation staff person met me at our garden, walked me through the options, and made sure that I understood the caveats of the program. But we are an outlier, already operating a compost program and willing to internalize the human resource costs associated with stewarding a Brown Bin. Sure, other organizations, some other organizations will do the same, but this decentralized community drop-in program assumes that community organizations are capable of managing public infrastructure, something the, sh the city should be funding as yet another element of the organics program expansion. We face the question of systems change and the costs associated with wide-scale behavioral change. We're halfway up the mountain now. The New York City Organics Residential Program is already the largest in the country, but we face an issue where only early adapters are using the program. I understand that brown bins stand at curbs unused or seriously contaminated. I've heard many times of supers and landlords removing the bins, hiding them from residents, or even taping them shut to bar residents from using them. Many people do not understand why they should use their brown bins. And I hope the city continues its support for the program. Additional efforts need to be made to educate and engage with residents, not only about, about how to recycle and compost, but about the importance of waste reduction. People react to different things, and the same narrative and explanation will not work for everyone. I'm not going to read all the details, but some of these different approaches include looking at long-term economics, the idea of diverting from landfills and 
processing nearby and improving the processing capacity nearby by increasing demand for that capacity. Uh, pest mitigation, this question of black bags versus, versus brown bins that I know you've talked about, but uh, as far as I know, there was no formal study conducted. Being able to provide data really helps people. Um, food and nutrition, our soils are less healthy than they were 70 years ago. We've broken our food system and we need to close that loop again. Uh, and resource allocation, just generally the idea that land is finite and landfills are not a good use for our material. Um, we've received feedback and comments from residents that have received bins without any advance warning. We understand the Department of Sanitation sends mailers out and has outreach staff on the road during the day. Um, neighborhoods with high rental turnover, generally those people, um, you know, they're not going to be there a few years later. Um, but what about wall murals, street signs, social media, bigger and bolder signage, and a giant URL printed on the bin for more information? We need to pull out all the stops. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. I'm going to run. Yes. yes. <laughs> the fifth person ought to come join us. Um, hi. Um, my name's Steve Newman. Um, I live in Councilman Valone's district. Unfortunately, he had, unfortunately, he had to leave. Um, I used to be the form, I used to be the uh, first deputy controller of the city, actually twice. Um, and it's relevant because if you go back to the original recycling law in the mid 1980s and look at it, you will see it was introduced at the request of council members, uh, Messenger and Ferrer at the request of city controller Harris and Jay Golden. I spent a fair amount of my time negotiating with the mayor and his staff the passage of the original uh, city recycling law. He's also the former chair of uh, Community Board 11, and I'm presently the treasurer of an environmental foundation. I've retired from the work world. Um, I'm here to tell you why it doesn't work in my community. My community is 500 homeowners. When this first began, my estimate would be that three to 400 of the homeowners complied and happily did it. Slowly, they dropped off. They dropped off each time a raccoon would open the brown bins. The brown bins don't work in my neighborhood, and it doesn't work in any other neighborhood, which um, has raccoons because they're pretty smart and they use their claws to open cans. Um, there are cans that are raccoon proof. Every one of the residents in my community has them. They were sold by the local, designed and sold by the local hardware store. The sanitation wanted to learn how to keep that from happening, and at least in my neighborhood, it would dramatically increase the participation. I'd be happy to describe the ones that do, that do work, theirs doesn't, they're, they're easy to open. Um, the second killer for our community was the switch from twice a week collection to once a week collection, meaning that you have to keep smelly food in, in your house. The biodegradable bags leak. Um, so the present outcome, and today was a collection day, so between 25, to 40 homeowners still do it. The ones who do it are either so highly motivated, they get up early in the morning to put it out, put their, uh, they may have put the rest of the trash out the night before as I did, but I was up at 6.15 this morning so I could get the composting out by 6.30. The people who still do it, either people like me who want to do it enough that they do that, or there are people who are going to work and are willing to spend the time doing it before they head out. Um, and, it's all, and that's all designed to beat the raccoons, basically. Uh, I can tell you on my, um, my regular garbage was knocked over this morning, but it's uh, by, a, I'm sure, by a raccoon. And my across the street neighbor's garbage was knocked over this morning. Neither had a problem because they're in these raccoon-proof garbage bags. Um, the brown bins just don't work and need to be rep replaced um, with things that do work. In probably a significant percentage of homeowner communities, any places near water 
or, or you a passive fox. So thank you for your time. And I, appreci I appreciate that. Um, they, they work, I think they work against the city rats, but maybe not the raccoons. So. They, they may work against the rats, but raccoons, one, are s smart, and two, more importantly, their claws operate like fingers. And so they're o they quickly learn how to open the okay. latch. So we have the ear of the commissioner here, so okay. we'll, we'll see where, where that goes. I'll be happy to tell you what does work. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you for your testimony. Um, thank you. My name is uh, Christina Dazio-Mero. I am the co-founder and executive director of the Lower East Side Ecology Center. And uh, I've been involved in community-based um, composting since 1990. Um, Currently, uh, our organization runs a collection and processing program that handles about 500 tons of organics a year. And um, in full disclosure, we are also partners with the Department of Sanitation and part uh, proud part of the Manhattan, uh, of the New York City Compost Project. And we handle outreach and education and collection in Manhattan. Um, I um, wanted to um, talk a little bit about um, comments that we have, and we are very thankful to, um, to um, Chairperson Reynoso to hold this um, important um, hearing today. Um, and I want to first talk about the curbside collection program. Of course, it is a very ambitious program that really got rolled out on, uh, in a very short time frame. And I feel um, the emphasis was on rollout, not so much on really studying or understanding what works and what doesn't work. And I would really like to <coughs> recommend that uh, there will be some resources allocated to really find out what works in neighborhoods, what are the uh, barriers, why people are not participating. And um, a hearing like this today also brings up uh, people that come with this testimony, but I think it also needs to be more uh, scientifically um, documented to really find answers of how we can get people to uh, participate in this important program. Uh, the second point I want to talk about is uh, to find more um, capacity for the ever-increasing amount of organics that we are, of course, going to collect. Um, when I heard uh, the testimony from Melissa when she said there were uh, one million pounds of organics ripe for composting uh, in the organic waste stream alone, and then you think about the 400,000 tons in capacity that DSNY has currently identified, uh, we're heading definitely into a problem. I think you alluded to that too with the question, and I would really uh, I would really urge the City Council to start thinking about siting of, uh, of compost facilities within New York City. Um, I have some ideas, uh, I put them out there. Uh, for example, Hunts Point uh, Terminal Market has a lot of organics already there uh, from the vendors, it's city-owned property. I just think we need to find a political will to push that. Uh, there's also other uh, large uh, areas in the city. I uh, just singled one out, Floyd Bennett Field, for example, in Brooklyn, Queens uh, neighborhood that uh, at least um, from a perspective of having land at a disposal and also uh, being a public land uh, should be um, something that just needs to be explored also. Uh, maybe DSNY facilities that are not uh, um, could be retrofitted to, uh, to offer space for composting. I think it's just really, really important. And lastly, I also think that uh, we need to create if incentives for the finished compost. So it's not enough to just collect and then to have capacity. We also have to have incentives to use the finished product because again, we need to really talk about <coughs> how we're going to have more and more um, of this material to handle and um, I would recommend that uh, there is procurement created where that really creates incentives for uh, any city contract to use locally made compost. So really uh, thinking about composting holistically, it's collection that's important, but then also the processing and then the end use and all of that needs to really grow over time uh, for us to have a successful program. Thank you so much and um, I'll punt it to Thank the next you. person. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chairman Reynoso, for your time and council members. Uh, this has been a, an education for me, um, and I appreciate it, and I want to 
learn more about the council and some of the things we're engaged with and also to share some information about um, what we do and what we have to offer to New York City and DSNY. Uh, my name is Myron Alexander. I am the Senior Vice President of a company uh, New York uh, uh, called AwareCo. We are a New York and New York City based NWBE, uh, which provides a, a line of on-site food and organic waste reduction systems. We provide assistance to government agencies, businesses, institutions, and municipalities across the country. Um, we provide an on-site solution, uh, which does not involve the use of water enzymes, chemicals, uh, just a power source and a drain. Um, and we have we produce two, two eco-friendly uh, products from that, which is a dry biomass and condensate. Um, and since that time, we have we have provided uh, our our uh, technology to the U.S. military across the country. 29 Palms, uh, Fort Lee, Fort Hood, um, Camp Pendleton, Quantico, um, and we have helped them reduce their waste on site there across the country. We've also supplied um, our technology to educational institutions, hospitals, correctional facilities, convention centers, hotels, and casinos, even as far as Las Vegas. Um, the reason why I'm here today is we began our contact with DSNY in 2014 under the advisement of Mr. Uh, Ron Donan. Uh, Mr. Donner suggested that at that time that we submit <coughs> a proposal to DSNY to explain to them how we could be of service to the city and the supporting agencies of which we uh, have supplied. Uh, in that time, uh, we were selected as one of only two companies statewide uh, to conduct additional research with the Rochester Institute of Technology under New York State Pollution Prevention Institute to examine the efficiency of the systems and also to look at how to upcycle those materials into other environmental friendly products. Also at that time, we have gone to support of, uh, actually we have also have a unit available and on display you working at the Golisano Institute for Sustainability in Rochester. We have gone to support of uh, Senator uh, Kevin Parker from Brooklyn, uh, and also um, Mr. Esp Espinal, also we've met with to talk about the syst these systems. Um, the reason why I'm here essentially is to say how we can be of service to reach out to DSNY and other departments. We've reached out to DOE, DCAS, NYCHA, USCCS, and CUNY to look at how we can help them develop programs, some of which have already actually been in use across the country. As you, I heard you talk about the school, there's one where the schools have actually used the machine, they've created the, uh, the amendment, it's gone to a compost facility, the school has a slight buyback pro uh, program with them, they actually use the money that's been raised for a rainy day fund, buy a kid a coat who doesn't have a coat, get books, help kids on the lunch program, that kind of thing. We think that's been a great program. Um, so what we want to do, uh, we know there's very few NWBEs involved with DSNY in the city um, in terms of organics. Uh, we'd like to extend a hand to help. Um, they're here. They have a wealth of knowledge. They're engaged with bioengineers and other uh, research institutes around the country and doing some really exciting things that are working out quite well that I think the city can do. I'll be sure to get the contact to DSNY so that you can engage f past Ron Gonin. Um, Ron Gonin. It's been a while since he's been here. So um, we'll, we'll get you on board with the folks that you should be talking to and we'd love to see if we, being creative is the most important thing that yes. we have, uh, the, one of the most important things that's uh, yes. helping us accomplish our goals. So um, I don't think that they would be against them. Um, you know, you for having materials as well. Uh, absolutely. Um, so now I gotta go vote in Atlantis here. There is one more. Is there a person? No, I think the fifth person conceded. They they said what did, what did they do? They uh, yeah. They said that they're not gonna they're not gonna speak so that um, we can allow someone else to speak. Um, I'm going to have to go vote in Atlantis hearing now. So I'm gonna run out. So I apologize to everyone, but uh, this meeting is adjourned.